Welcome back to the Original Gangsters Podcast. I'm Jimmy Bucciolato here uh, with a remote episode with my partner in crime and co-conspirator, the intrepid Mr. Scott Bernstein. Hey, now. And uh, before we introduce our prestigious uh, uh, guest here, uh, we would like to remind everyone, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Please follow us on social media. It's a big help in terms of spreading the word. And uh, we're super excited for our special guest today. Uh, Mr. Anjay Nagpal is here with us. How are you, sir? I'm great. Thanks for having me. We're going yeah. Hollywood. We're going Hollywood today, baby. We're yeah, on this the, is, we're this on the is, Sunset Strip, just rocking it out. Another uh, big Hollywood guest, and we've had some some Hollywood producers on before. We've had uh, Hollywood directors on. Our friend uh, Gentili, who directed American uh, Murderer, uh, was was on our show before. So um, so. Uh, we're, we, we've done this before. We like to mix it up and talk about popular culture. Um, but uh, actually, the main focus of our episode today will be a podcast that Anjay is is uh, producing and putting out there, which is Brokers, Bagmen, and Moles. It's about financial corruption in Chicago, a lot of connections to organized crime and, and the outfit. Um, so anyhow, welcome. Again, thanks. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited to uh, to be on the show. Maybe a little intimidated about your guys' knowledge of uh, of Chicago organized crime, um, but excited to chat. We'll be gentle, but I, I think people should know uh, before we start. I mean, Anjay is a is a real rising star, not just in you know the, the Hollywood uh, scripted space when it comes to a uh, film, but also making this pivot. And that's what we're going to focus on today This pivot to a, a podcast network that he's been building, but he comes from a, a, uh, a background in, in producing uh, some, some big, big Hollywood films. We were talking off, off, uh, off camera. He, he was one of the producers of the Joker, um, which just, you know, took, uh, you know, pop culture by storm a couple of years ago. There's a sequel that's coming out, but now he's, into the into the podcast space and he's got this very very compelling and riveting story uh 1980s chicago wall street mob it's 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 great thanks Let's guys try. um yeah i'd love to i'd love to um you know t tell you guys about the show and and our company and um you know you tell me where you want to start i'll dive in i'll dive in anywhere but i'm excited to talk about it well, what, what is it? Uh, tell us a little bit um, a background to this podcast first, and then we could go into like how you became interested in this. But just uh, right away, give our audience an idea of, um, you know, I mentioned financial corruption, some ties to, to the outfit. But uh, tell us how you you conceptualize this this podcast. Yeah, sure. So it, it came about in a really interesting way. Um, and originally, uh, I was developing a concept uh, for television, for scripted television, based around this world of, uh, you know, floor traders, the old floor traders that you saw in like Eddie Murphy's Trading Places, um, because it was such a wild and interesting world. And um, and the, other than Trading Places, they really hadn't ever you hadn't really ever seen, uh, you know, this this version um, of a financial scam uh, before, and so. Uh, I learned about this FBI investigation at the Chicago Mercantile Exchange and the Chicago Board of Trade. Um, thought it would make a, a, a great scripted series. Um, and then uh, during the pandemic, decide uh, at, at the encouraging of a friend, um, Dennis Stratton, who's an executive producer on our podcast, um, who had experience in audio, said, you know, this would make a great, uh, a great kind of documentary style podcast. Um, and I said, yeah, you know, you're, you're actually right. It, it, it would be. And so we just started, you know, kind of putting that together, um, started doing interviews. And, and now we have a, you know, a 12 episode um, narrative nonfiction podcast about the FBI investigations into the, the Board of Trade and the Mercantile Exchange in the late 80s. It's available on all pa podcast platforms as well as YouTube. Um, and it's called Brokers, Bagmen and Moles. And uh, yeah, it's, it's out now. Uh, would you say that um, it has kind of um, a vibe? to like movies like wall street wolf of wall street in terms of like that kind of high stakes culture where ethics get blur get blurry and <laughs> yeah yeah sort of murky 
terms of behavior. yeah, a- a- absolutely, absolutely, and that, I think you nailed it. You know, um, morality does get blurry. You know, there's a there's a great quote um, that one of the defense attorneys used, and to describe you know what went on, like you know people people ask me all the time, like, well, how how were these guys cheating? And and you know. Um, just just from a high level, the government accused Chicago's brokers of uh, stealing millions of dollars from their customers. They said it was a systematic corruption um, that everybody on the floor was crooked. Um, we don't know how they they heard, you know, how they knew about that because it was such a closed club, a closed society. But somehow they they thought everyone was crooked um, and they thought these brokers were stealing from their customers who weren't on the floor um, and using kind of other traders in their in the area as, as bag men. Um, and the details of, of how they stole are are pretty um, complicated. But, you know, from a high level, basically, they would they would kind of, you know, take a customer's order um, manipulate it or, you know, trade it at the wrong price and then, you know, uh, put some money into one of their kind of partner's pockets and then split the difference later. Um, sometimes they would trade after the market closed and things like that, that, that wasn't, um, allowed, but, you know, at the end of the day, um, you know, this, this was the, at the time it was the most expensive investigation in, in the history of the FBI. And because, you know, they had to have four, four traders dressed up as, or sorry, four FBI agents undercover, you know, pretending to mix in with, with the Chicago traders, which I thought was going to be a difficult job. Um, and then going undercover and trying to gather evidence to, to present a case. Um, but what you'll, what you'll learn is, yeah, there, there's, there's no black and white. There's a lot of shades and gray, shades of gray here, you know, because um, th- there were, there were some people who, you know, broke the rules and, and, uh, they actually, you know, broke the rules in, in order to try to like actually help a customer out to actually do the right thing. Um, and there were some other people who egregiously stole a lot of money, um, and, you know, trying to get to the bottom of, of which is which is really tricky. And one of the reasons kind of the investigation was maybe a little, um, just kind of not planned as well as, as it could have been. So, but it, it goes into that world of, you know, uh, there's there's a ton of money being made. There, these these markets, um, Chicago's futures exchanges expanded from being um, all about agriculture and commodities, right? Um, those are that's how these exchanges started in the 1800s. There were places where farmers would, you know, um, exchange crops. There were actual you know mark, uh, agricultural markets, and then they turned into uh, markets where you traded futures contracts. And then in the 70s and 80s. Um, they stopped being just agricultural exchanges and they started trading financial products. And that's when things absolutely exploded and people were making money hand over fist because there was just so much volume. And that's when, you know, uh, the moral gray area was, was, uh, you know, crossed the more, the line was crossed by, by some traders who, you know, just really were making so much money and ended up uh, manipulating and abusing the system um, which was all done. And that's a big part of this too. It was all done via open outcry trading, which is basically just, you know, you've seen the, seen the movies and you've seen trading places and things like that. And there's also a scene in Ferris Bueller's day off where you're looking at the, I was about to say Ferris yeah. Go to the board. Like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so so you, you know, your stuff. Um, and so like, you know, the, the system made it, made it so that it was kind of easy to steal. Like, you know, you're doing stuff with the hand signals and, and, and yelling and screaming, you're writing it down with a, at the time, pencil on a piece of paper. And like, yeah, you got pencils, have erasers. And, and, you know, it, it was just like, it was just easy. This, that system made it easy if you wanted to, if you didn't have a, you know, if you had a moral gray area uh, to, to steal. And then, you know, that, that's kind of where our, our thing goes. Like the initial, the initial, um, you know, kind of log line is like the, the FBI, you know, said there was massive corruption going on that all these brokers were just stealing from their customers. The traders said that the that the investigation was the total wipeout and waste of taxpayer dollars. And like, where's the truth? Um, but at the end of the day, uh, and at the end of the day, like on paper, the investigation wasn't that successful, but it did it did create some change. And the biggest thing was like, you know, that system should never have existed. Um, and 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 the reason that it did was because a lot of the people who who you know had the most at stake um, created this system of like self-regulation 
um, and, you know, lack of governmental oversight that they that they very much paid for um, with with very aggressive lobbying efforts. Um, and so it becomes kind of this examination of like that that system should have, you know, should should have um, should have worked much better and should have had better regulation and and all that. So sorry, that was way too much. I know you I know no, it, it, you're trying to keep it simple, good. but uh, that's There's the interesting part of the morality. I yeah, I think our audience is a, uh, a, a a higher thinking type of audience for this type of thing. I think that a lot of times earlier in the podcast, I was over simp- uh, over explaining things, and I think at a certain point, I kind of. I, I wasn't appreciating the audience. So I think the audience for this is, are the type of people that can kind of keep up with it and come at least our Chicago people. I know uh, this is not in the city of Chicago, all this stuff that was going on. It wasn't a secret. Um, I wanted to throw an anecdote at you wrapped in a question from some of my uh, research. And there, there's one very vivid visceral uh, situation that I know happened at the Board of Trade in Chicago, and I, I'm wondering if you ever heard this before, um, and and how it was or wasn't emblematic of the whole uh, atmosphere. So there was obviously a lot of finesse and boardroom gangster for, foresight, forethought, pine, you know, pioneering um, white collar stuff going on here. So I'm not trying to diminish that aspect of it. But when you're talking about the mob organized crime, especially the Chicago guys, you're talking about guys that speak most of their language in brute force. Um, so I guess my, my first question, and then I'll just throw the anecdote up that I heard and, and have you answer the question and tell me if you've ever heard that anecdote before would be, did you guys in your, uh, in your investigations or the stories that you guys are telling, did you ever encounter like true, you know, a, a situation where people were fearing for their lives, fe- fearing for their safety or their safety was compromised and they were hurt or killed. And the, the anecdote I want to throw out at you, I was made aware from multiple people and I believe it, is in a court file somewhere that uh, a guy, a, a pretty high ranking guy at one point, Louis Marino went by the nickname Louis tomatoes uh, that Louis Marino and, a, and his protege at the time, a guy named Mike Zatello, they called him a one Mike. They had a debtor or they had some guy on the floor that they were unhappy with, that he wasn't doing what they told him to do. And they went into the, in the middle of the Chicago trading floor and like beat this guy up and like hung him by his feet over like a balcony or something. And this happened in front of a bunch of people. Have you ever heard that? I haven't heard that one, um, which I'm, I'm surprised by, but I, I don't doubt it at all. Um, you know, crazy stuff happened down there. Um, yeah. and I think that was, and, I think and, that was the late eighties, 88, 88. Yeah. 88. <laughs> I mean, you know, th- that's, that's wild. Cause that could have been, right at you know when this investigation was still yeah. still ongoing um because it this this started in in the uh, technically like in 84 beginning of 85 and and went all the way to 89 um but i i hadn't heard that that specific one but you know there was a lot of uh involvement between the you know the outfit and and the trading floor and that 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 um, happened in many ways, like, and, and we tell an anecdote. Um, so, so obviously look like gambling, uh, traders are gamblers. They, a lot of the guys, you know, gamble Doing a lot. Drugs, and, there's a whole, yeah, there's, there's drugs, like side gambling. businesses. Yeah, there's, yeah. Exactly. And not, and then not to mention that, like, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, outfit guys had, had their, like, they got their, their son's jobs at, at both exchanges, but mostly at the Merck. Um, and I, I've worked with, with, uh, one of those, I, I, I guess we should, we left out a nugget, which is that I, I was a trader at the Merck for a couple of years, uh, in, in the early 2000s. So after this, much after this investigation, um, and I was in the options pitch, which are like a little bit of a different world, but, but, uh, you know, so I, I, I'd even known a bunch of people that, that, uh, 
uh, you know, that had Alpha ties. In fact, I, I was traded in the same pit as um, the son of uh, Jimmy Marcello, who's currently yeah. incarcerated. You guys talked about um, he he tragically died of, of cancer um, and, well, and was a really recent. Yeah. Yeah. And he was a very like lovely guy, nice guy. Um, but anyway, I, I, just to say that, you know, those well, I think our audience, I think that's best. something our audience would yeah. be interested. I mean, just you'd say you don't yeah. have to go any deeper than that, but just the fact that. Well, I, uh, I mean, I, I didn't know him super well or anything like that, but but just the fact that I knew he was there, I knew who he was. Um, but, he, you know, you wouldn't know from from talking to him. I mean, he, he was a really just a funny guy, nice guy. And, and, uh, um, but, and there was, there was just a lot of those kind of last names that you, that you would, you know, recognize. Um, and we can, we can talk about them individually, but, I, but I do want to circle back to your, your question of like, yeah, there, you know, these, these things intersected in a lot of ways because, um, obviously drugs, gambling, uh, and that, and that kind of stuff. And, and, and also like in a big, big kind of thrust of our shows, like what about money laundering? Right. And like, you know, where, where people wash your money on the floor. And, um, you know, we, we strongly, for, first and foremost, you know, one of the, one of the things about our show is like when I kind of started to take a deep dive into this investigation, um, you know, what you read, I, I just started to, to pick up on things that there might be more than, uh, more going on than, than what's been published. And one of those things was, there were a couple little nuggets here and there of somebody mentioning money laundering. And I was like, yeah, that, that sure seems like it could have happened given all the people that were down there, given that uh, the exchanges are probably a pretty good way to, to uh, you know, a lot of money if you want. And, and so that was a big threat of like, it, you know, the FBI kind of claimed all this investigation was just about trading violations. It's all we were looking for, you know? Um, but by the end of our show, you find out that, nope, they, were, they in fact were also looking for organized crime activity, including money laundering, including gambling and drugs and all those things. So it really was a two pronged investigation. And that's kind of one of the, the, you know, things that you learn about in our show. I don't want to go too, too deep into it, but, you know, just uncovering in our investigating that, oh yeah, per my hunch, uh, you know, that, that the FBI was, was, uh, definitely keeping tabs on some of these uh you know out for related people seeing what they could seeing what they could sniff out in terms of um drug dealing gambling um any kind of other activity so yeah and, and in fact there's a great story that uh lewis borsellino tells in his episode that um that you know he heard you know the, the origin of the investigation is also a little murky it's like how did they figure out that there was all this stuff going on on the floor um and there was a kind of the, the conventional wisdom is um, that uh, Archer Daniels Midland, which is this big food processing company in, in central Illinois, you guys probably heard of um, that. They complained they were a big customer of the exchange. They complained that, that they were getting ripped off on the, on the floor and that's what started the investigation. But, you know, we pieced together that while that was a part of it, um, you know, the FBI, the FBI had already been kind of, clued off to clued clued into what was going down on the floor um through a couple of different ways and one of those is which they heard um you know there had wiretaps on bookies and drug dealers in town and and they they'd heard you know conversations with bookies talking to people and and uh you know some some guy would lose 50 grand on a bears game and uh and and they would call Louis Porcelino and be like, hey, this this you know this trader is he good for it, you know? Um, and and then these guys would say stuff like, oh well, oh, don't worry about it, I'll pay it, I'll pay, it. I'll, I'll just steal it off the deck this week. And uh, steal it off the deck means basically steal it from my customers. Like a deck is a pile of customer orders, so it's like, yeah, don't worry, I'll just grab it, you know, I'll steal it this week and I'll I'll pay my debts down next week. Um, and and uh, you know, Lewis had, had heard heard that story and told it to us and. You know, it's pretty incredible, but but that's kind of how it was like, you know, and that's going to raise <laughs> eyebrows, right? It's like, wait, I'm sorry, with, the, with this 25 year old is getting $50,000 of cash and, you know, in the mid 80s, how? And uh, that's definitely kind of one of the things that. And he, and he, that, and Louis yeah. Borsellino, who, who you just referenced, I mean, this is one of those guys that, that, you're, that you referenced that you're talking about, um, you know, sons of prominent Chicago wise guys, sons of, frankly, mob killers uh you mentioned jimmy marcello yep. we're not we're not uh besmirching his reputation by saying that jimmy marcello is is right now doing life in prison uh for a double homicide 
Um, and uh, Louis Borsellino's dad, unfortunately, was on both sides of it. You know, he was an alleged killer, and then he was a victim of a gangland slain. And, uh, you know, he was a part, Lewis's dad, uh, I think his real name was John, but he went by Little Tony or Tony Borse. Uh, so Little Tony Borsellino was a major member of what they called the Wild Bunch, which was the, the elite uh, enforcement unit for, for the outfit in the 70s and early 80s. They took their name from a, an old uh, cowboy movie. And they were just a bunch of desperados, guys that were, you know, this was a, a ragtag group of uh, thugs, thieves, and murderers. Uh, kind of each one was more depraved than the other one. From my research, Tony Borsellino was kind of the lesser depraved of that whole group. I don't think he was as sociopathic as some of those uh, Butch Petroselli and um, Harry Allman and, and, uh, so, some of those guys, but Tony was a, was a guy that was allegedly doing hits for them. And then when they were covering their tracks from some of those hits, they got rid of the guys that actually did the, the hits themselves. And, and Tony Borsellino was killed, I believe in 1979. But, uh, this is, this, his son. And I, I don't know more than just that his son is a guy that, uh, has been looked after by a lot of his dad's friends, but he, he pops up, you know, right on the radar of your, uh, in, in your story. So that, I think that kind of encapsulates a lot of what we're talking about. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, you know, he, he's such an interesting guy and, you know, I thank him for, for talking to us and being so open and candid, uh, about everything. And he, you know, um, doesn't shy away from who his father was. He, he kind of come, you know, it's kind of, he leads a lot of conversations with it because he just, you know, he wants to get out in the open. Um, he's, he's spent a lot of time, um, you know, trying to, um, you know, let people know that he's, he's legitimate. And, um, you know, this is, and so he, he's at, you know, I mean, think about it. I can't imagine, what it's like growing up like that um, with, with having your father be that, you know, that kind of, a, a, you know, a, a alleged hitman, like you said, um, you know, have it getting, uh, you know, murdered by the outfit and then and murdered you know, by the spe- same spending your murdered life. by your friends. Right. So it's like, yeah, yeah. Of course, you know, you have to reconcile who your dad is. That's one reconciliation. Right. Right. But yeah. then you're, you're thinking back. I'm sure I'm putting myself in his shoes. I don't know. I'm guessing you're putting yourself back. Hey, all these guys that were around my dad, all these guys that I saw as Uncle Tony, Uncle Harry, Uncle Joey, they're probably the guys that killed my dad. Well, that's, yeah. that's, that's, the, that's the tough, the, the, you said you talk about gray, and there's a lot of gray. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of gray in this in these worlds. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, Lewis talks about that a lot in his episode, which uh, I believe is episode eight uh, of our show, uh, seven or eight. Um but yeah, he, he talks about that a lot. He's, he's really not afraid to go there and, and t- talks about, you know, ha- having a dad who, who had a different, you know, morality compass, but he also was a very good father, really looked out for his family, you know, kind of turned it off and on of like, yeah, when he's out, you know, at work, he's doing, you know, really potentially awful stuff. And then when he's at home, he's just a great family guy and, you know, taking care of, taking care of his family and just wanting to, you know, be present with them. Um, so yeah, very, very crazy, you know, uh, life and, um, you know, you know, Lewis was a, a really known to be a great trader, uh, made a lot of money. Um, it's had just an epic kind of life story, lots of ups and downs, um, over time, but, uh, yeah, he seems like a real stand up guy and, um, uh, yeah, he's, he's, he's been through a lot, like you said, and he, he tells a story in our show that, um, he, I guess uh, Joey Iupa, who was in charge at the time, um, asked a favor of him to to get uh, his nephew uh, down to the floor, and um, and he said he offered up that he said, "Hey, what happened? Your dad was a mistake." Um, and so I don't know if that was an apology of sorts for that hit or whatever, but and and you know, Lewis just said well, like, "I, hey man, what's done is done. I can't. No, what can I do about that? You know, and and uh, trying to move I, on." 
Can I wow. color, can I color that up for a second? Yeah. So it's it's interesting that that you tell that you're saying to me that Lewis said that because from from what I recall and how the the timeline of that all went was that Ayupa was worried about his driver, uh, a, a guy named Jerry Caracello. They called him the Dinger. And again, according to the FBI, it's never been proven. Uh, Ayupa gave the contract to kill Dinger Caracello to Tony Borsellino. And one of the reasons he wanted Caracello out of the way was because Caracello had done some jobs for them or with them. And they basically just wanted to, you know, cut that loose end. Mm -hmm. And then I think there had been some informants that started giving information to the FBI about the Caracello hat, Caracello hat, which resulted in Joe Ayupa ordering Tony Borsellino's murder allegedly to cut that tie. So it's right. interesting that you're saying that Borsellino says that at one point Ayupa says it shouldn't have happened that way. When in reality, it might've been Ayupa that made it happen that way. Yeah. Well, I, I think, you know, that, that is interesting. And like I said, this is why I was intimidated to talk to you guys. Cause you know, everything. Yeah. I think it's, yeah, I think it's interesting though, because I, I think maybe what he was trying to say and, was that like you know not it was an accident but like i'm sorry it had to happen but like you know it had, it had to happen but i'm sorry it had to happen like kind of thing you know what i mean like so um that he didn't it didn't seem like he shirked responsibility for it or anything but he was just kind of like hey tough tough thing what he happened had, to your dad it had it had to happen like it was a casualty of war kind of well that's what it was tony borsellino hadn't right. done anything right right he, i think that i think that's a sentiment follow yeah. orders Right. I think that's the sentiment he was trying to get across yeah. to, to Lewis. And, um, but, but it's funny too. He, he just, you know, his son, I guess is anyway, he, he tells a funny story about Joey Aupa. Cause I guess the nephew was also named Joey Aupa and he was getting paged down on the floor. And so like o over the loudspeaker at the Merc, you'd hear, you know, paging Joey Aupa and everyone kind of stopped. And, <laughs> Everybody you know, was what, what's going on here. Yeah. And so. Cause uh, at that time, uh, at that time, uh, Joey Aupa was the number one boss, the, the Joey Doves was the number yeah. one boss in Chicago. Uh, he ran things from around 72, 73, I believe, until he got locked up in 86. But uh, I, I, I'm, I digress a little bit here, but I've always thought to myself that Joey Ayupa, we were talking about Batman and, and uh, villains in the Batman universe uh, earlier in the episode. For some reason, whenever I see Joey Ayupa, I think of like a real life, the Penguin. Like he looks at me <laughs> like if you were gonna cast that, yeah. a, a person as the penguin. I know they have a character now that uh that did pretty well um uh you know in the last Batman that they're making a spin-off of uh, Colin Farrell. But I always look at Joey Ayupa and I'm like, that guy looks like the penguin to me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean a lot of these a lot of these uh old, No, he looked at old, a central casting, yeah. Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. But yeah, I mean to your point, you know, like Louis Porcelain is a guy who you know he, he's a legitimate trader no he's never been uh in diet or anything um but again he's still uh, at the center of a lot of um you know still has a lot of relationships um the outfit but that's you know it's family it's the way he grew up and and uh yeah he, he i think that's also an interesting thing about kind of chicago in general is that i think a lot of the a lot of the, the me members of the outfit didn't want their their sons following him uh into that life um yeah, i'm sure some did but for the most part from my experience too from people i know that that uh it was like no let's let's get you down a different path and and i think that's one thing that that Lewis is less, very yeah definitely less than new york i would say with chicago bringing in um the next generation there definitely were examples of guys that got brought in after their dads but yeah. as i'm thinking off the top of my head right now of all of those big players in the eighties and nineties, not a lot of their kids. I mean, Ayupa didn't bring his kid in. Jackie Cerrone's kid was in kind of a Cardo didn't bring his kid in. Um, DeFranzo didn't bring his kid in. Jimmy Iandino, who's the most recent member of the wild bunch to pass away. He passed away uh, 
back in February or March. You know, he didn't bring his kid in, I don't believe. Yeah. So it's it's interesting that you point that out. I think that is something. Of, yeah. No, not yeah, yeah Detroit, definitely. I think in it's... Detroit and New York, they're just starting now to not bring their kids in. Like once. Oh, really? That's in. interesting. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think they had that mindset of like, you know, you know, obviously that, that, that lifestyle gets glamorized a lot in movies and things like that. But I think from, from my experiences and from my research uh, and, and interviews, like a lot of the, the mentality was like, Hey, we're doing this because we have to, you know, like we're, we're just trying to, trying to get somewhere in life. We're trying to, you know, change jet future generations of our family. And we don't want to have our kids, you know, do the same dirty work that we're doing here. Um, and, you know, something kind of, obviously for for criminals but there's just something noble about that uh, uh you know concept at least and there is, there's so, i get yeah. on my digress a little bit but there, there is one example currently right now of uh one of the regimes within the outfit allegedly being passed on from one generation to the next and it's a it would be the fourth generation i believe or the third generation uh it's on the south side the chinatown crew uh, with the Caruso's, um, Tootsie Babe Caruso, whose dad Skids Caruso was the couple before him. And then Tootsie Babe has been in there for quite a while. And then there's rumors that uh, um, little, little, little Frankie or little Tootsie uh, could be uh, yeah, him. And actually, uh, the, the head of the Wild Bunch was Joe Ferriola. He brought his kid in. And right now, the, the word on the street is that Joe Ferriola's son, Nikki, and uh, Frank Caruso's son, um, little Frankie, might be uh, coming up to take over that that one crew. But other than that, I think that's more of an outlier situation in the outfit, going back to what we were saying. Yeah. A lot of these main guys didn't bring their kids in. Yeah. I mean, I don't even know these days, uh, you know, most of my knowledge is kind of back around that 80s, 90s, 2000s time, but since uh, Family Secrets – happened i don't know too much about you know what's going on these days I and mean, what is the it's still the, there it's still yeah. there it's just you know the the newspapers and the uh chuck gowdy still does a pretty good job um tribune and sun times i i, I still kind of scratch my head at, at why they stop the coverage it's great for me i mean i i scoop it up yeah. and i take the coverage uh but i i wonder why they stop writing about it so, well, yeah. I, I, I have a I have a theory is because I would say in Chicago right now, the Italians are the least of their concern in terms yeah. of gang organized crime violence. And I, I think it's it's similar to Detroit when th we have this debate, Scott and I, with other people on the podcast and other formats, um, because the FBI is not actively as actively investigating Cosa Nostra in Chicago or Detroit because the media doesn't cover it. Some people think, well, oh, it just doesn't exist anymore. And we have to explain that, no, it, things are very complicated. And and media, for every newspaper, right, their, their resources are shrinking. And, and the Department of Justice, right, their resources are always fighting over resources. And you have to prioritize, whether you're an editor, a yeah. publisher, or, or, or a, the head of the FBI division or organized crime task force, and where are you going to allocate resources and I just think in Chicago right now, whether it's the media or the feds, it's just not a high priority. It doesn't mean that it's gone away. I, I would say that the scale is much smaller, though. I, I think that point is well taken. The scale is much smaller than it was in the 70s, 80s. Um, but but that doesn't mean it, it doesn't exist, right? Stopped, they, and, and we've talked about this before, but I want to throw this out to Anjay. They've stopped killing people for the most part. Yeah. I think that, <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. the difference – between yeah. the mob in the 20th century and the mob now. Not that it doesn't exist now, but murder is truly a last resort measure. And, you know, right. I, I don't want to belabor the point because I think I've said it on here a bunch. I don't know if Andre's heard it, but, you know, between 1980 and 2000 in America, you had hundreds of mob murders, if not more. Uh, between 2000 and 2023 in the whole country you've probably only had a dozen mm -hmm. yeah so just yeah i mean and stark, stark contrast in, in the in a 20-year uh sample size that makes sense and that's obviously a good thing you know um but and also like i think so there some of the 
you know, the murders and the hits were so sensational too, right? They were just, you know, um, unfortunately headline grabbing, but, but, you know, the way that the splotch was died, the way that a lot of these people, you know, a lot of these murders were carried out were, were, you know, they were violent and, um, you know, just, just kind of shocking. And so, um, that was, yeah, that definitely grabbed headlines. I want to ask something about uh, your investigation and if this comes up in the podcast. So you talked about some of these guys who are living on the edge. And so they, they gamble, maybe have drug habits. So they end up rubbing elbows with wise guys or connected guys. But did the outfit actually get their hands in on any like actual white collar crime? So like either money laundering or the pump and dump uh, type scams. Uh, can you can you speak to that or was it more of an indirect relationship um so you know our 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 primary objective of the show is was again just kind of dive as deep as we could into kind of what happened in this investigation um and you know so it's primarily about trading and 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 uh you know the people on the floor that were indicted and all that but but we did learn a lot and um and you know i'll say that we we leave our show uh, with questions about, uh, uh, you know, further investigating into that, that kind of mob, direct mafia presence. But I can tell you that I've heard a lot of firsthand stories um, about um, n- not so much pump and dump stuff, but money laundering for sure. Um, you know, several instances of that things, that, you know, some, some shaking down of, uh, people that were on the floor with through various, uh, you know, kind of uh, methods that that you know made gave money to the mafia. Um, so definitely money laundering, and then um, uh, just you know kickbacks that 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 uh, you know certain uh, brokers were getting that they were supposedly shuffling off the floor to uh, to the outfit. So. I think that there, there there was some direct connections between, um, you know, money that was made on the floor and and um, either washed and and returned the outfit or just made uh, through underhanded uh, kind of you know techniques that that were also kicked up to um, to to mafia guys off the off the floor. Um, haven't been able to prove any of that. I don't know if you ever can, but yeah, I definitely heard heard a lot of stories of, of actual direct involvement. Um, but, but that's something the FBI never, never put a finger on while during this investigation, that's kind of one of the, one of the fascinating things, right? It's like, they were, they, they were looking for, uh, obviously, you know, crooked traders and they were also looking for all that kind of mafia activity, but, but they didn't find it even though it did exist. So do you think that in some ways, because I know, as you mentioned, there are the, the, Critics that ultimately, or they say that ultimately the investigation really didn't uh, produce enough results. But in some ways, can you say that it, it at least, um, you know, shined a light and forced the cockroaches to run maybe a little bit? So even if, even if there weren't a yeah. lot of indictments and does that make sense? That kind of yeah. for music? It, it, it totally does. I, I think like that, that's the FBI, um, you know, the FBI agents who are involved. Yeah, they, they kind of answer the question the same way. They're like, look, on paper, did it, did it, you know, like like the world on fire? Does it look super impressive next to, uh, you know, the Ivan Boski and Michael Milliken and some of these other massive financial scandals that rocked Wall Street in the 80s? Probably not. But at the same time, yeah, they, they you know, a big part of their job was just to expose what was happening on the floor. And what was happening on the floor was while there were a lot of honest brokers there were a lot of people who were just playing fast and loose with the rules, including a lot of the people who were in charge of the place. Um, some were pretty egregious. A lot of money was being stolen. Um, and, you know, like the level of drugs and, and, and gambling and all, everything that was going on down there. Yeah, it was, it was, it was definitely a little out of control. And so, um, they, they, and, and, you know, they say, but yeah, like we, we exposed it. Right. And like um, we, we exposed a lot of this and, you know, th- these things got huge media attention when they were first announced. I mean, you know, it was the front page of every newspaper in, in the country and I'm sure a, a lot in the world, too. Um, I mean, think about it. Like, it, it's, it's, it's a big story, like actual corruption within our financial markets. Right? I mean, it's not, you know, this isn't like some some boiler room off the floor stuff. This is talking about like where, you know, like a, 
these these gigantic financial institutions that we're supposed to trust as as American public and the inside of those things, the people who run them, the people who do the trades, like we're accused of like this massive corruption. And so that's a big deal, you know? And, and so they, they were like, yeah, look, we, we did our job as the FBI. Could we have done it better? Yes. But we, we shined a light on this stuff and it's up to Congress, it's up to lawmakers to change the system because everybody realized that that open outcry system, the way it was, you know, so loosely monitored, so loosely enforced, very poorly regulated by the federal government, um, it was all by design. And, and, and so they, they wanted to change that. And, and so they, they did shine a spotlight on it. Did they actually change it? I would say they accelerated the change, you know, change was possible. Computers were starting to, you know, trading was starting to go computerized, but the people that ran the exchanges in Chicago, you know, they made a lot of money from the exchanges. And so they, they had no interest in, in, in accelerating that and making, uh, you know, uh, trading computerized so that there was a really clean audit trail. They were like, no, we like this gray area that we're living in because guess what? I not only run the exchange, but I also own a brokerage firm. Yeah, you know? specific and I'm, I also trade. Yeah, exactly. Like I trade, I have a brokerage firm, I run the exchange, I do all these things. And it's like, you know, that that's what needed to be changed in my opinion. And, and, and uh, it, it, it did get, it did change slowly, but kind of ironically, the, um, uh, one of the things that that uh, that happened was the exchanges also went public, and you know once you become public, well then you're now you're regulated by the SEC, which they weren't regulated by the SEC originally, um, and and so things changed over time. And computers, you know, you, can, you can't slow down tech, or you can't stop technology. You can maybe slow down a little, but you know it was always going to go computerized. Um, it was always going to you know, be more scrutinized, but you know, while they had the moment, they, you know, a lot of people wanted to to take advantage of it, let it last as long as humanly possible. So they could, uh, you know, so they could, they could profit off of it. Yeah. I think it reminds me of, so I teach a course crime and film. And uh, one of the films we talk about is a documentary called inside job. And I don't know if you've seen that Anjay or Scott. Um, but oh, that, I love it. It was one of, it's, it's, it's one of my favorite movies of the last 20 years. Yeah. It's a really, it's a, it's an excellent documentary. And, you know, we have um, a general policy of, of not really talking about partisan politics on this podcast, but we, we do talk about criminal justice, public policy. And um, I would say that one of the takeaways from that documentary, and it reminds me of your podcast is that uh, when people argue, Oh, they were, they were, um, abusing the system I, I i make the argument no actually it was working exactly as it, as it was supposed to right that's the way as you and i you said something really striking a few minutes ago that it was designed right so mm -hmm. and, I, and the same thing with that wall street corruption yeah. like it was it was baked, baked in. in it was baked totally. in to, yep. to let these guys get away with these sorts of shenanigans um yep. so it wasn't so much a failure as actually it, it, it's that's how it was designed and it was it was working for people like that um, unfortunately there's a lot of exploitation and things going on. So I, I agree it, it, you know, we need to have these regulations and reforms, but, um, I just, that it just, I reminded me of that documentary when you said that by design. Yeah. 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 To I mean, that, that's, I haven't seen that in a long time. It's a great, great film. I should go back and watch it. But, um, but yeah, I mean, that, that's exactly right. Like that, that, you know, and there's even a, an episode, episode 10, um, is all about these congressional hearings, um, where the heads of the exchanges go to uh, Congress to, to basically, and, and there's the exchanges were regulated by something called the CFTC, which is a commodities futures trading commission, which is a part of, which is, was, is, is a, they designed it. Like then the exchanges designed their own regulators and it was a temporary, like this, this was an underfunded under, you know, staffed, um, entity that just didn't really have any ability to regulate um you know properly didn't have the the resources and the and, and it sat within the agricultural department right i mean these are like so the biggest financial products in the world were being traded uh and overseen by the agricultural department basically which is just insane right and there was a big debate at the time of like why is that happening that made sense you know 100 years ago when we were selling uh, you know when, when the when the Chicago markets were all about agricultural products, but it doesn't make sense anymore. And so there's this big fight to like, hey, no, like this should be regulated, like just like New York Stock Exchange, like every other financial, you know, uh, market. But and then and then 
in those testimonies, which we cover, um, you know, one of the senators, um, you know, is like, well, why is it this way? It's like, cause, cause Congress designed the, the, you know, the, um, the regulation to be, to be timid and why is yes. it designed to be timid? Well, cause the, you know, the, the political action committees of the Merck and the board of trade, which to your point, totally, they were nonpartisan, you know, and, and they, they liked all as literally one of the heads of the exchanges was like, no, we like all politicians. Um, <laughs> of course, you know, including, green. Including, <laughs> yeah, including our right. friend, Dan Rostenkowski, he's the best, you know, yeah. um, and, and, you know, all, all these other people who ended up being, you know, crooked politicians or whatever, but, you know, they had a very elaborate system, which we outlined in our show of like, they spent tons of time in Washington. They're, the amount of money that they raised from the members, from the traders uh, at the Mercantile Exchange and the Board of Trade was astronomical. It was among, you know, there's only a couple thousand employees there. It probably wasn't in the top couple hundred of companies in size, but it was in the top 10 of the amount of money that they were contributing to, to politicians. And the way that they, you know, spread that out to, to um, you know, the the senators and Congress people that kind of helped to oversee them and, you know, have this timid system of regulation in place. It was just, you know, it's looking back at it, it's all transparent that, you know, they, they basically paid for the, the Congress to, to design this timid, uh, you know, regulate system of regulation. And it's, it's pretty wild. Uh, but, but that's how it went down. And, and that's what you see, I think over and over again uh, in these kind of big corruption cases is yeah, it's a, it's a finely orchestrated system that to your point works exactly like someone wanted it to. Andre, are you, are you yeah. from Chicago? Yeah, yeah. Where do you grow up? So I, I was actually born in London. My, my parents are uh, immigrants. And then we, we uh, I grew up in Chicago in the city on, on the northwest side, actually pretty close to where, uh, by Portage Park area, pretty, pretty close to where the Spilatros and and uh, like Jimmy Colennis and some of these other people in our uh, T-Bun, who's a, a, episode, uh, a character in episode two. Um, pretty close to, to some of those guys, probably, you know, mixed neighborhood, blue collar, a lot of Italian, Irish, uh, Polish, you know, kind of immigrants, but in the city, uh, close to like Belmont and Austin is where I, or Belmont, uh, yeah, Belmont and Austin is kind of where I, where I grew up. Did you stay there for college? Uh, I was at University of Illinois for college, so I went down okay, to Champaign, okay, yeah. Uh, right. but yeah, 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 yeah. And then I, I didn't move out to, or then I, and then I, you know, traded for, at the Merck for a couple of years um and also was in san francisco for a little bit and then i came out to uh to la to to go into film in my you know mid-20s uh, and have been out here uh ever since it's been a while nice anything else you got uh well, kind of scott cooking? lived in uh scott lived in chicago for a while that's why sorry to interrupt yeah that. that's I the just, reason i was asking know, I, I i was in i was in chicago um i spent the summer uh, junior and senior year of college and then I was there for eight years so it was like eight years and two summers so ten summers eight years <laughs> nice yeah I mean it's great city. I love going back I, I still have you know family tons of friends from high school and college and uh and so um you know I mean that's also it was it was fun to work on this podcast because it you know took me back to to growing up in Chicago at that, that time. So, you know, when I was, when, when this investigation took place, you know, I was just a little kid, but those were like your formative years, you know? Yeah. Um, and that, that era was a, was a pretty special time in Chicago with the, you know, Michael Jordan and, you know, the bears and, and just kind of the, the, the culture in the city was so great at the time. It was a lot of fun. Um, great, great place to grow up for sure. It's a great um, city. I mean, it's like, I, I consider it a second home. Uh, I didn't get out there for the first time until I was, 20 years old and I fell in love with it and kind of stayed there and into my early thirties. So um, anything else you yeah, got other crazy. than the pod that we're talking about right now that you want people to know about or uh, stuff? You oh yeah, absolutely. About? I mean, we, 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 we have some things for your audience as well, for sure. Um, uh, two, two, two things coming up are one, a, um, a show that is um, uh, has a lot to do with the Milwaukee outfit and the Cal and the uh, Balistrary family. Um, and so we'll, we'll definitely look forward to talking to you guys again about, about some of the shows. And then there's another one that has to do with, uh, family secrets and, um, the Calabrese, uh, case that, that has a, 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 a an interesting angle to it that I, I like, I'll, I'll tell you guys about, and we'll, I would love to chat further with you about them. Um, but yeah, yeah definitely, definitely a couple more things in the organized crime world. And we're also doing other stuff like long form sports stories and, uh, entertainment and culture. Um, but, uh, you know, there was a lot of crime and uh, there's a lot of untold stories in the world of 
of organized crime, true crime, white collar crime. So I hope, I hope you can help. Uh, I don't know if you're working with Frank or Kurt, whoever. Yeah, I hope you can get yeah. get their story to the big screen or get it to a, a streaming service for a, um, a television adaption. I, I'm shocked that we're sitting here 20 years later and there's there was a movie option I know with Gary Ross for a second. But yeah, uh, that actually, is, uh, Taylor made Taylor made. Yeah, for there there is a project. There's a script out there. In fact, one of my buddies is uh, attached to produce it. I, I haven't uh, I haven't checked in with him on what the latest is, but absolutely. I mean, there's that that story is just absolutely it's incredible. Um, I was in the court. I was in the court for the for the whole thing. So. Oh wow, <laughs> that's my okay. my family affair book was kind of based on my uh, covering of the trial. So I saw it up close and and personal for about five months uh, from June of of 07 to October of 07. Okay. There's actually a classmate of mine who was a very young at the time defense attorney who was part of that um, trial. And I talked to him about, about, about Darryl? this once Darryl? in a while. Uh, Darryl? No, I don't know. I don't know if he wants me to, I don't know if he oh. wants me to talk about this right now. I, <laughs> well, I, I know Darryl, Gold, the, Darryl yeah. Goldberg yeah. was a really young guy who I grew up with. So that's why I, it's not the same okay. guy, but uh, he's no, from Boonville yeah. Hills. And he was he was the second chair for Twan Doyle, who was the uh, the dirty cop that was mm -hmm. in in that thing. And we were, I was, yeah, I don't think I was even thirty yet. And so he was like, he was twenty eight, twenty nine. Yeah. Um, you know, at one of the biggest federal trials in the history of the city of Chicago. Yeah. Yeah. Same. I, uh, sounds like my 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 friend took a similar. And then, um, had a similar role, but yeah, it's just incredible. That's shout out and, to Joe Lopez, who I think uh, consumes us. Joe, the shark, uh, he was the Calabrese attorney. Yeah. Yeah. He, he had kind of, like a, love, a, he and him had kind of yeah. a love hate relationship, but nothing but respect for you, Joe, if you're watching this. Uh, is he, and then is he still around, he sounds like, I mean, a lot of the lawyers in Chicago, you could, you could just do Joe the shark. He's, about, he's, a, yeah. he's still one of the top guys. Yeah. Uh, he's he's state he's federal he does everything he dresses like he's uh you know walking out of a humphrey bogart movie um <laughs> it really lives is very colorful i mean I, I said to him like you know you live in a mob city when even the attorneys have nicknames yeah. like joe the shark yeah exactly 100 <laughs> and then ricky, it, maybe, ricky halpern who god rest yeah. his soul uh he was the um attorney for Joey the clown at that trial and was to me by far the, the star of that trial, at least from the defense table. Yeah. Um, and his, his client was his, was his own worst enemy, but uh, you know, Ricky passed away uh, unfortunately uh, too soon. And, but uh, great, great lawyers at, uh, all, all across the board at that trial. And uh, for a young guy like me that was wanting to study crime, I had just graduated law school Um it was really a dream come true and it, it set me off on the path that I am here today on. So, yeah, well, that's great to hear. It's a great story. And I'd love to come, like I said, we'd love to come back. And, um, you know, when those shows are out, uh, I think probably next year, uh, and next year, or sorry, beginning of next year and this year, somewhere around there, um, love to, to, you know, tell you more about them ahead of time. And then hopefully we can chat about them because there's some really incredible, um, you know, really incredible stories that haven't really been told yet. And so that's what we're all about. Yeah, I want to, before we uh, wrap up, I just want to say that uh, regarding that, that I appreciate you, uh, you know, developing these stories as someone who's a Midwest guy, because I think too often people think of these kinds of stories and they think it's only New York. With all due respect, we have a big East Coast audience, so you know, no, no disrespect to the our East Coast audience, but there are a lot of these interesting stories in places like Detroit, Milwaukee, Chicago, Cleveland. So I think it's it's really cool that that you're taking this opportunity to tell those stories. Yeah, I mean, I, absolutely, and I, I, no disrespect at all to the New York, uh, uh, you know stories they're, they're they're incredible they've just seen the light of day a lot um a lot. you know and uh, yeah yeah a lot and and so i mean look you know chicago is it's like it's not like it's a small town it's a, it's a big city it's a big market and so like it, it's kind of odd to me that yeah something like family secrets is still hasn't hasn't really but like in uh, chicago you if you know, if you were john Gotti's plumber or john Gotti's um the guy that delivered his milk if you could write a book and make a million dollars <laughs> yeah. that's right yeah that's right. Yeah. But, yeah. It, but sometimes the the stories, the the real meaty stories, 
uh, in the Midwest or, or in, in families outside of New York sometimes get marginalized. So we're just, we appreciate uh, yeah. and tip our hat to you who, who's making sure those stories get told. For sure. All right. Thanks guys. I appreciate it. And yeah, de definitely. I mean, they're, you know, again, the, 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 some of these things happened, you know, in my backyard when I was growing up and, and so, um, yeah, I think they're, they're, they're as interesting as anything else I've, I've ever uh, come across. So, um, and, and I mean, you know, last thing I'll say is like, even in, um, you know, the, the, the Splatros, right. Um, in, um, uh, Goodfellas, Casino. right. Or sorry, Casino. Yeah. The, the, the last scene in Casino, you know, that, that was, you know, there's, they, they masked the what's interesting is like, they masked the true names and identities and things like that of those people. And they didn't say Chicago in the movie right. at all. Cause they, they cause they were back they were home. They back home. Yeah, yeah back home and is there they were concerned about rights and life rights and things like that the studio didn't want to get sued but so even that which is basically a chicago story right the chicago las vegas you know still most people don't don't actually know that that's Good point uh that's what it is so yeah well it's uh it's hard it's hard if you're from the if you've ever spent time in the area though it's hard to confuse the accent that uh the joke that joe pesci is portraying for his Nicky Spilatro character he's he obviously spent time with a dialect coach or a dialect yeah. coach and he was really laying it on heavy with the Chicago accent I thought it was great yeah um, yeah yeah but uh if for some for people like I think to your point for people that knew they knew what they were watching for people that didn't know you're right it probably was more of a just the the mafia right. the, the generic right. mafia without understanding that they were talking about uh, the bosses in Chicago or Milwaukee or. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So um, yeah. just want to remind our audience, Brokers, Bagmen and Moles is the name of the podcast. Uh, you can subscribe to it, find it anywhere where great podcasts are available. Um, we look forward to uh, finding out more content from you, Anjay, more films, more podcasts. Um, I'm, I'm jealous. I love Southern, Southern California. I've spent a lot of time in San Diego <laughs> Grew up there when I was a kid. I miss it. Although I, I love Detroit. I love Detroit. Don't get me wrong, but I'm, I'm a little bit jealous. <laughs> I miss I love, oh my God. I love it out there. Yeah. The greatest thing I ever did was decide to start playing in that sandbox over the last decade to get to go out there. And, and even though I'm not living out there, I get to at least experience yeah. it. I can't yes. complain. I, I, I love Chicago. My only two complaints are it's, geographically undesirable and the weather sucks but yeah but other other than that it's it's pretty it's pretty much the perfect place uh but uh yeah thanks guys appreciate appreciate it. this has been a ton of fun and look forward to chatting again yeah good luck with everything yeah. Anjay. and thanks, uh, guys. We thanks we thank everyone for listening and watching again please subscribe and we'll see you guys uh next week jimmy bucciolato we're out